<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> we are a bit in shock because of the light, which blinds us a bit. And Again, a good evening. Dobro pozhalovat, as you should say in uh, Russian. This is going to be an evening between uh, two gentlemen with ties and uh, uh, fashionable jackets who are going to <laughs> talk about Russia, about Russian literature, about the war in Ukraine, about Vladimir Vladimirovich, our biggest enemy of today, uh, about, yeah, actually about love and life. And um, this evening is going to be yeah, full with music. We've got Ellen Boers on the accordion and the mezzo-soprano Harriet Schenk, who used to be my wife, who still is my wife. <laughs> and yeah, used to be my wife. <laughs> and they are arranging some Russian and Ukrainian, they're going to, to perform some Russian and Ukrainian songs. And yeah, and at the end of the evening, we're going to launch a magazine, Maxim organized himself, an, a, a magazine for Russian writers in exile. And it's called The Fifth Wave, Pyatria Volna. And it's the fifth wave of Russian emigrants. And it's a very strange situation. Maxim is one of them. He is in exile, a Russian writer in exile. And there are hundreds of Russian artists, writers, playwrights, etc., in exile nowadays, and they want to publish their stories, if they can, if they aren't completely paralyzed uh, by what is going on in Ukraine, by what is going on in Russia. We're living in times of fear, and that's where, what we are going to talk about. But first, we're going to listen to music. Do you remember we were sitting at the river and I was singing a lovely song for you? But all happiness has gone. Was it only a dream? Oh, 
a Russian song about love, which which ends, which is which is completely lost. Um, Maxime, um, you even invited me because you invited me to 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 also to talk about my Russian experiences, and actually, it's your party. Well, so I feel a bit strange in your company during okay. this. Okay. Well, thank you very much for for joining me here. And uh, yes, you you spent some time in Russia, uh, and uh, I I don't think you need any introduction here. You are so famous uh, <laughs> in the Netherlands. But I will just read what I have: Dutch journalist, writer, and historian, being Russia uh, Russian correspondent uh, for NRC from 2007 to 2012. Traveled extensively for his work throughout Russia. It's true. It's true, okay. So you wrote some, uh, some books about Russia, I guess, at least five or even more. Five. Five. Uh, but you selected uh, three of them to be discussed here tonight. So would you please tell us uh, about your work and you know, your yes. connection to Russia. Yeah, my connection in Russia is it's, it's very easy because as a child I fell in love with the country and it was after I saw uh, uh, Heifetz uh, film uh, The Lady with the Lapdog based on Chekhov's story. Mm -hmm. And it was such a beautiful film with beautiful music, with beautiful actors. And from that very moment I was completely addicted to Russian literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, a colleague of mine, Eva Peck, she wrote in the, the book supplement of this evening uh, an essay about how she spoiled her whole love life by reading Russian classical novels. So you shouldn't do it, actually, uh, she wrote. And, and I'm a man, un unfortunately. She also didn't spoil her love life. But uh, I, I, I became addicted. Mm -hmm. And I traveled to the country. I studied Russian history, history with a professor of Russian history, Jan Bezemer. And he was a great storyteller. And when we left the college uh, hall, it always ended with a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. And he was telling, and how it, how it will continue, you will hear next week. Mm -hmm. and then, of course, we all came back next week to listen to his stories. And he only was, he was himself a correspondent for only a year in the 60s in, in the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. And he could tell stories about, he, about how he went to the countryside drinking this kind of glasses filled with vodka with the local peasants. And mm -hmm. uh, it became a, a, a romance for him. Mm -hmm. And he, he gave his love to his students. And there are several of them uh, in this hall this evening. They're already in their end of their 60s and 70s, but they are also still in love. This is a book about two Jewish writers, Isaac Babel and uh, Vasily Grossman, mm -hmm. uh, during the days of Stalin. And actually, it says everything about the country. If you read it now, again, I, I recently had to give a short lecture about it. And I thought, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the Russia of Putin, about the Russia which suddenly started again after the beginning of this war with a huge repression. OK, not with gulag camps, mm -hmm. but with political opposition uh, uh, people being sent for a long time to prisons. Uh, Vladimir Karamursa, who has been mm -hmm. sentenced to 25 years in jail. Uh, Ilya Yashin, a friend of mine in Moscow, is sent to eight years in prison camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, it's in this book about his writers. Uh, Isaac Babel was shot mm -hmm. uh, during the heydays of the Stalin terror. Vasily Grossman wrote this beautiful long novel, which you all should read, uh, uh, Life and Fate. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually my Bible. It's already for 20 years a Bible from which I, I can open the book, read something out of it. I think this is wisdom. This is how I should behave or this is what I shouldn't do if I want to end my life properly. Yeah, Suslov said that it will be published, I think, in 100 years or something. In, in like 200 years. 200 years. Because it was, it was like a, a, a nuclear bomb uh, okay. under the Soviet communist system. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's an interesting picture that you picked up uh, for a cover. Uh, was it your choice or it was uh, no, no, it was, it was uh, the, 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 the publisher suggested it and I immediately thought because I've been living in such a house, mm -hmm. such an apartment in Moscow, some 200 square meters mm -hmm. with this parquet uh, floor 
and this this doors and oh. even the the previous uh, owner of it was mm -hmm. a communist lady who now turned capitalist because uh, she married a Japanese businessman and became a millionaire and she rented it to us for 4,000 euros a month. Mm. So, but it was more or less the same, the same atmosphere in the house where I felt immediately comfortable. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing about this picture is that uh, looking at it, you know, talking about understanding, uh, why, you know, people ask me, uh, why don't I, I write about what I see around me these days? It's, I don't understand it, really. <laughs> uh, you need at least half knowledge to, to, to write, uh, to be surprised and to understand at the same time. So here, looking at this picture, I can say a lot of things about it immediately. It's uh, Lektionov, who... The artist. Yeah, the artist is Lektionov, a very Soviet uh, picture, very official you know, art, and so there is a family of which moves in the new apartment, but who lived there before, probably someone who was repressed, right? Uh, and they, you know, see the, the man on the, on the, you know, taking the bicycle into, onto the balcony or something. Uh, he's not present here, so Stalin is the real father of this young young boy, young pioneer, you know, and the uh, woman, uh, obviously, she is a you know a, maybe a peasant, you know, maybe just hardworking woman, but she doesn't belong to intelligentsia. She doesn't belong to she doesn't belong to this life. So it's just you know, and there are many small details uh, we can talk and talk and talk. Do, looking do, the, do you recognize picture. something from your own family history because? Even your great grandfather was repressed, as, as far as I remember, during the Tsarist times. Well, uh, no, not Tsarist time. Or, already Stalin beginning time. of Stalin. Yeah, 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 it was in 1932. Yeah. He was imprisoned. Well, each generation of Russian, Russians had their own catastrophe. And I felt like, why I'm so lucky? I mean, I, I, had, I lived up to 59 years. And uh, everything seemed just just fine, uh, but you know somehow we all knew that that will will happen. That these you know property, these duchess, these uh, houses that were built, we will not you know pass them to to next generations. So this is something uh, you know my 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 father experienced uh, catastrophes. My mother did. Uh, my great parents did, so you know, uh, I you became no uh, exception. Why were they repressed? No, they were not repressed, but like my father was Jewish, so in 1952, when this nice family moves into a new apartment, uh, he was thrown from the train, you know, by there was a huge anti Semitic uh, company, and he, he was unemployed for, you know, a year, more than a year. Uh, and there was a uh, you know so-called Jewish um, you know doctoral uh, plot and other other ugly things. Doctors uh, so, who were accused yeah, of yeah, being of trying being, to, to yeah. kill the, the Kremlin elite. Yeah, yeah, etc. etc. But you have two more books, right? Not <laughs> let's let's we'll turn to, to his that. to his work yeah. also. <laughs> and uh, uh, the uh, the left one is uh, uh, Chekhov's glasses, mm -hmm. and it's uh, actually more about my days as a correspondent in Moscow. I, I suddenly I de decided to to travel throughout Russia to follow uh, the footsteps of my great literary hero Anton Chekhov. Mm -hmm. And I during my my uh, days of reporting. I very soon found out that the Moscow, the nowadays modern Moscow, it ends after a hundred kilo kilometers mm -hmm. outside the town. Mm -hmm. And then it's the Soviet Union. It's a country where actually nothing functions, where all these lonely factories are standing, not functioning, where the majority of the elderly people are completely drunk. We have been to Birobijan on a Sunday afternoon where all the people from 13 till 83 were completely drunk. And I still remember Harriet crying mm -hmm. because she was so desperate about how, can this, how will this country ever change. And at the same time, we met so many 
decent people who Chekhov also mm. met during his days, people who really wanted to, to improve the situation in their country, who indeed wanted to, to, to have a better life for their children and grandchildren. Mm. And unfortunately, those people nowadays left the country mm -hmm. or are sitting in fear uh, and are afraid of being arrested, if it is possible, because they are the ones who should open their mouth, mm -hmm. who don't dare to do it, and uh, who are taking care of their small families. Mm -hmm. So that's what the book is about. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the last book, it's The, the, uh, the Sound of Utopia, mm -hmm. as the title sounds in the English translation, which will appear at the end of this year at mm -hmm. Pushkin Press in London and at Galaxia in uh, Spain in oh. Spanish. And I don't know how it will uh, uh, sound then. It's about making art in yeah, under a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harriet and I, we, we, we perform all over the country, and people ask us from time to time, do you still dare to sing Russian songs? Do you still dare to talk about Russian music? Because we should cancel it. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing which happens from time to time. And then we say, no, it's, it's about Russian music, but it's about composers and about musicians who try to, to make art in days of repression. They try to resist this repression. They try to, to do what's in their head. They try to survive by art. And that makes this music special because when you, I, I was not a great fan of Prokofiev's music because when I'm at home listening to music, I'm always reading a newspaper or a book. Mm -hmm. And for Prokofiev, you, sit, you, should still, you should sit still <laughs> and listen attentively, which I did. And now I'm one of his greatest admirers in Holland. And I feel his life was completely demolished by this system. His music was from time to time forbidden. And I'm in contact with several uh, uh, Russian artists nowadays, and also with uh, a writer, a female writer, Guzel Yagina, mm -hmm. who is uh, living in Kazan and in Moscow, and she's writing about the Stalin repression of the, uh, of the, 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 the Tatar, the Tatar mm -hmm. population. And she, her name is, is taken off this uh, theatre uh, uh, programs. She's, her books are taken out of the bookshops. Mm -hmm. And it's about his book. Mm -hmm. How can I you see. perform? How can you make art in, in uh, days of dictatorship? Yeah, interestingly, they take away the names of the authors, so it's like anonymous plays, but they still play it because they need... They still play. Uh, they keep you know, the illusion that uh, everything is fine. It's just, you know, minor changes. Uh, I would be interested whether they will keep my name on, on the play uh, that they actually perform in St. Petersburg every month. Uh, so after this magazine, which we'll talk about later. Because uh, mm -hmm. are you, your books are still for sale well, in, in Russia nowadays. Yeah, are moreover, you... uh, they promised to, to, to publish a big collection of my well, the, the collection of all my stories this year, all together, in one big book. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is paradoxical situation. Yeah, and even mm -hmm. uh, uh, even though the the government probably doesn't know that you left the country. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so I didn't. You're you're <laughs> at this very moment, you're still safe. We're going to talk about it later. First, we now turn to your work. Yeah. We're, okay. We're going, let me. You're going to to tell us a bit about. All your books. Yeah, and these are some books. Yeah, they are. Some oh, books in, over there. in Russian. I wrote not too many uh, things. It's six novellas, 12 short stories, three plays, 12 essays, uh, and they are translated into uh, 20 languages. Uh, and I had, uh, you know, a Typical, I would say, not typical. Even it was, uh, it's, it was a very good career uh, of uh, Soviet, you know, Russian uh, physician. Uh, I was born in '63. Uh, then I, uh, you know, was at medical school, residence, fellowship. Then I went to United States. Uh, I had, um, I got a grant from American Heart Association, and then. Uh, in '92, I returned back home because USSR collapsed at that time, 
and I was very, I would say, patriotic. I really felt, uh, you know, I need to be there. And uh, but you could have stayed in the U.S. Yes, if you had wanted. Yes, I had some, you know, suggestions, you know. but uh, but I didn't want to. I didn't like it uh, there. You know, I just wanted to be uh, there. And you know, first, I I didn't regret about. Well, I haven't regret about it. Mm -hmm. Never, uh, but so we all had the illusion that uh, now the life will go, you know, let's say take a European path, uh, whatever. But in 1992 it was a complete chaos as far as I remember. Yes, it was complete chaos, but it was a time of big hopes too, and uh, everything seemed to, you know, develop. Uh, civil society, uh, you know, uh, different mm -hmm. kind of organizations, everything. Now it's all, you know, it's all now uh, at the ground level. They really destroyed the whole, the whole society. Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole social life is destroyed. All people have is Facebook. You know, it's it. You know, for for you, it would seem funny. You know that the the old you know social life is reduced to Facebook, but in fact, uh, it is. It is like that. So uh, we all had great hopes, and then you know I was a medical publisher, and then uh, in 2005 I returned to uh, medical work. And I started a small charity uh, in Tarusa, in Tarusa, which is kilometer 101 from Moscow. Uh, and so uh, then in 2007, I, it was my first literary publication, actually. And since then, you know, I uh, really... Uh, and, and this publication was, um, uh, it called, uh, In My Native Land. Uh, so from Kraju in Russian, and it made some, you know, it had some success and mm -hmm. it made some uh, resonance. Uh, so uh, since then, I, you know, combined uh, combined two things. Yeah. Because you were living in Tarusa, I've, I've been there once for for a few yeah. days. Yeah, this is my house. It's, uh, this is my window to the left. Yeah, lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it is still there. It's one of few few things I really miss mm -hmm. about Russia is Tarusa, these trees that you know we uh, just uh, they were very small when we went there. Now it's and your daughter who is a violinist with your son-in-law who is also a yeah, cello. They live in, in Frankfurt. They live Whole in Frankfurt, live but in Frankfurt, they they yeah. have a string quartet, and I can yeah. imagine them sitting on the this veranda. <laughs> playing music in summer days, because you invited me before the war started. Yeah. We, it, it will not take place, unfortunately. Yeah. And this is this the river. It's, yeah, it's a the very Arca. beautiful, very idyllic uh, place. With w uh, the, There is the Museum of Marie de Cetaeva, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's a place where everybody of us would like to live mm -hmm. for a few years. Yeah. Um, how was life when when you you started uh, started in Tarusa? How was it for you? You you started to work in the hospital. You were a cardiologist mm -hmm. by, by profession. How, how was it? Because you wrote about it. Actually, you wrote. Mm -hmm. I still remember this sentence: uh, uh, "People they live, but actually they don't want to live." Mm -hmm. Well, was the the sentence was. Well, the idea was that, that it was uh, the. Uh, the um, uh, fear of death and unwillingness uh, to live, you know, at the same time. Uh, so yes, well, it was shocking, but it was it was interesting. It was very interesting, and I really felt it is, you know, my place. It's the place where I should be. Uh, so I, I loved it. Yeah, but you were yeah. also confronted by these local officials by this local uh, corrupt police, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you wrote about them. Mm -hmm. Did you adjust to, to that way of living? Uh, well, I would say... You think, say okay, it's like that, we cannot change it. No, no, well, first of all, we changed something. Uh, we changed the whole, uh, you know, the all officials in Tarusa were changed in 2008 
uh, after we had, you know, a, a fight with them. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, a huge resonance, uh, and and they changed uh, the whole the whole crew. Uh, so you know we succeeded. Nowadays we'll will be just put in prison without, and we would not dare even to uh, to resist. I would say. And, and why do you think that was possible to to have a, a civic movement? Well, it was again you know it was the days when Medvedev who, you know, it's strange to say these days, mm. but he was thought of being liberal. You know, nowadays he is just... You know, he is the main fascist, yeah, yeah. I think, today. He pretends yeah. to be the main fascist, yes. But at that time he was, like he said, freedom is better than lack of freedom, you know, things uh, like that. And so uh, it was, yeah, they somehow, it worked. You know, in 2008 it was, different different uh, situation, different society. Because he also wrote a story about his civil servants. I remember this female mayor of the town who actually yeah. she, she sleeps with the local judge, she sleeps with, uh, with all the, ma the, yeah. the men in power to, 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 to rise herself in power yeah. in this day. But she has okay, a soul was... anyway, yeah. very, very... Uh, no, she, she ends up soul, like a very nice has... person actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, well, so in uh, February 24, 2022, we had to, uh, you know, after February 24, after war started, uh, me and my family, we had to leave. So uh, I also have this uh, slides. It is, you know, the war began February 24. Uh, we went to a small uh, demonstration. Well, there were only like seven or eight of us. Uh, and who uh, were they? Huh? Who were they? Who were the people? Well, they were people, you know, from Tarusa. Mm -hmm. uh, one, you know, doctor, mm -hmm. his wife, uh, me, my wife. Another doctor. Uh, you know, yeah. Musician. So there, there were seven or eight mm -hmm. uh, persons. Uh, I keep uh, the uh, piece of paper, you know, saying, Cain, where is your brother Abel? Because the, mm -hmm. uh, there was a speculation that this is our brother nation, you know, Ukrainians, we are going to help them to get rid of uh, fascists, whatever. So that's, that's why I put it there. And on the fifth day of the war, I, uh, my Spanish publisher asked me to write something. And I just um, wrote the smallest, short essay, the fifth day of the war. Uh, which was published this very day in uh, Los Angeles Review of Books and in some other places. And it is actually translated was, into, yeah. into Dutch. Uh, it's, it's here. Uh, and then uh, on day six, we just made a decision to leave uh, Russia because it was really intolerable, uh, the feeling. There was no direct threat to me or my family, but the feeling of, you know, anger, fear, uh, suffocation, disgust was so strong that I just felt that, you know, they take us, I spent 27 years of my life during socialism. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life during whatever you call it, fascism, totalitarian. Did, did you expect uh, uh, times to <coughs> change completely? Mm. after the start, start of the war? Did you think, okay, now it's all... I had several friends in Moscow uh, on the phone who, who told me now it's all over. And I, I knew several friends also who always warned me already in 2007 mm -hmm. that it was all fake and that it would end like it ended on the 24th of February. Well, I didn't have many, many illusions about what was going on, but of course it, the war came out unexpectedly. Uh, no one could expect just to, you know, just to smash your own country onto the, into the wall. I mean, it is... I mean, how, how did... There were seven protesters in Tarusa. Where yeah, there, there, were, there were... Also people uh, cheering, mm -hmm. like they did at, at the times of the annexation of, the, of Crimea. No, uh, it was different, you know. Uh, the, the annexation of Crimea really uh, provoked, uh, you know, a real... I would say joy among yeah. simple people, you know, among many people in Tarusa. Uh, this uh, war didn't. No, it was it was totally different. 
uh, the feeling was, uh, you know, well, of course, I, I guess there are some patriotic, you know, people there, uh, fanatic, mm. but uh, mainly people just, they don't want to be mobilized. The whole society was, uh, you know, demobilized for so many years because the idea of propaganda was do nothing, sit on your co couch, you know, watch television, uh, just do nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so now it's very hard to mobilize them. Remember people in, in Tarusa mobilized? As no, far as you know? no, no, I, I would say no. So all no. People, majority of people from the East? No, I, I will say. tell you, it was like you know, when there was uh, election of uh, a presidential election in 2012 and there were mass protests in Moscow and of course I also took part in this. Um, I asked my nurses from the from Tarusa. There were like four or five nurses. I asked them, "Whom are you going to vote for?" And they said, "Well, for Putin." And said, "Why? Do you like him that much?" They not really. So why do you vote for him? They said, "Well, because our director of our hospital, if she knows that we." vote against him. I said, well, look, first of all, there is no way she would learn it. Second, uh, she herself, I know for sure, will not vote for Putin. Uh, still, we are not certain. I mean, they said, uh, and said, uh, we are afraid. Afraid of what? And they never put gloves when they worked with, with blood, really. I said, you are not afraid of hepatitis. You are not afraid of AIDS of other, you know, blood transmitted infections, but you are afraid of that. Well, still, they went and voted for Putin. So, uh, can you call it a real support? You know, no. So, I think, you know, 70, I don't know the, the exact number, but maybe 70, 80 percent of population uh, lives like that. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where does it come from? I'm, I'm always astonished to hear such things. I've witnessed several election campaigns mm -hmm. and I've been standing at the voting uh, uh, cells in Moscow and Petersburg and always people were because my boss wants me to vote for him or her. But is it, is it Soviet behavior? Is it the Homo Sovieticus returning? Well, it is Soviet, but it is also uh, I mean, look at Americans, they, I mean, people vote the way their neighbors, neighbors vote, so the, uh, mainly. So I, I wouldn't blame uh, people, well, people are, you can corrupt people, you know, even adult people, you can spoil them. So people are spoiled, uh, spoiled uh, by Putin as well, but it started all at Yeltsin's time, you know, the first, uh, the, the second election, when uh, Yeltsin uh, was against Zyuganov, it was not a uh, fair election. Because the Yeltsin so, government was afraid of the communists coming back. Yes, true. Yeah, and I was afraid too, and I was wrong. And uh, I myself mm -hmm. said, I must admit, it is a big political mistake I made. I, I said, okay, give me a million ballots and I will vote for, you know, <laughs> throw all them. For, to prevent Zyuganov to be communist, mm -hmm. to, to get back into it, power. So now, when I have fake election, I always remember what I was saying myself yeah. at that time. Can you imagine that all the, those reforms of the, the Yeltsin government, mm -hmm. these economic reforms, with, which were very harsh for the ordinary population, people lost all their savings. Mm -hmm. But in the final end, I recently read an article about it, mm -hmm. they were more or less successful. Well, some were, some, some were not. It was, did, did, it was did, did they have a chance, these reformers of the 90s? Well, the, the main, look, I am not an economist or analyst or whatever, but the main, uh, I would say the main uh, mistake we made was that we didn't write democratic songs. If I, you know, the, the role of songs in Soviet uh, tradition is so big that we had, like, uh, they were written by very gifted, mainly Jewish composers, uh, and uh, Frenkel, Fratkin, you know, mm -hmm. others. Uh, and then uh, you, Blanter, one of the best uh, composer for the songs. So if you have a song, you take a song book, 
Mm. It will always start with songs about your homeland. Mm. Uh, so th that was the language uh, government spoke with citizens. So it was about all aspects of life. So it was about homeland, about your mother, about uh, friendship, about children, about nature, about self-sacrificing to help uh, you know, your friend, uh, all kind of, of things. Uh, so, uh, and you know, you need to replace it with somewhat else, because that was, that were songs that people sang for, for decades and they know it by heart. And we had the uh, anthem uh, with Glinka's music in the 90s. Mm -hmm. But I cannot recall it even, because it had no words. But the music is we, very good. Well, music you know. is very good, but what do you do with the anthem without words? Uh, and then, you know, these reformers said, no, no, market will put everything on its places. You know, so market. Uh, it was, uh, you know, they would rather write songs. <laughs> I, I remember uh, a, a Russian uh, Jewish poet, Kirill Medvedev, mm -hmm. who wrote an article 10 years ago about the betrayal of the intelligentsia in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Because he wrote that actually the intelligentsia forgot to unite mm -hmm. in this post-communist days mm -hmm. to formulate a new, yeah, plans for a new society, to formulate, formulate ideas, to, 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 yeah, to, to, to build up a society as, as we are used to. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Uh, Because many of the intelligentsia, you also wrote one of your first stories in, in uh, uh, your first book, which has been translated mm -hmm. in, into Dutch. The first story is, is about this young oligarch, and he rents members of this old intelligentsia mm -hmm. to, he is the rich man, but he is a very uneducated man. Mm -hmm. And he, he hires somebody to, to teach him history. He t hires somebody to teach him uh, music. music. Yeah. And they are people from the old intelligentsia with these glasses, with, with tape uh, collected. They are so very poor. They don't fit at all in this new post-communist society. Mm -hmm. And I know so many of them from my, ex from my own experiences in, in Russia. And actually, they should have been uh, building up this new society and not those former uh, KGB officers. Yeah, well, the, the problem is when I had uh, uh, in, in Leiden with my students, we read Babel, uh, Babel's stories. And in his stories, there are a lot of Cheka, people from secret police, uh, which is now FSB and formerly KGB. It's the same organization with long history. And, and, and criminals in Babel's story. Well, criminals are the most charming ones, and you know, Chika is also charming. In fact, not, none of them are charming. They are very ugly, uh, both criminals and, and secret police people. But these two forces are the only forces we have in Russia these days. I am not talking about, there are nice people, but they do not represent a force. Yeah. yeah, like in Poland, there were trade unions, there, were, there was a Catholic Church, which was very you know, strong, anti-communistic uh, force. None of this no. And they in initiated yeah. the fall of yeah. communists, the yeah. Catholic Church that's, that's, and the trade unions. That's true. Why didn't it happen in, in, in Russia? In the 90s, of course, you, you're, you're the right and the doctor, you, you, you don't have to explain it. <laughs> yeah. But can you guess? Because where, where people only being acting so individualistic mm -hmm. that they weren't thinking about the whole group, which I can imagine, because you told us nowadays they only watch Facebook, they are only living, they live their lives on Facebook, and they are connected to their most, uh, to, to their closest relatives because they don't trust anybody else. Your neighbor can betray you can hand you over to the, to the FSB, which happened with several young students in the north of the country, yeah, um, to this little, uh, li this little girl who made this drawing mm -hmm. uh, uh, in which she wrote something against the war. Mm -hmm. She is sent to an orphanage. Her father uh, is being sent sentenced to, to two years, and yeah. he tried to run to away. escape, so now we will get 10 years or something like that. Yeah. 
Well, I don't have answer to your question. I don't think it was unavoidable. Uh, and, uh, well, I think it is, you know. Uh, also, it's not just, you know, it would be an easy thing to say it's a bad luck, you know, or whatever. It's not just a bad luck. It's, uh, of course, it, it has its roots deep into, into Russian history, into history of, you know, our slavery for so many years. I don't know. Uh, so, what do we do next? Let me read a story. Maybe. Let, let's read a story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I have a few other yeah, slides. Something which like we just translation, these great are, expectations or something. These are, yeah, it, it, it's just two books in Dutch. Yeah, I'm very, very lucky to have uh, Van Orschot. No, it's, it's a question. Yeah. How, how did uh, Mark Peters from Van Orschot discover you? Because first you were translated uh, in America in this New York Review of Books classic series. Yeah, Isn't it? it was thanks in, 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 in lar largely it was thanks to Yolanda Blumen, my translator. She mm -hmm. was uh, uh, she wanted uh, my stories to be translated into Dutch, and she approached several publishers. My works were rejected. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky in this sense, and then it was picked up by Van Orschot. So. Mm -hmm. And was it the second translation after the, the, the American translation? Yeah, it came out yeah. after American translation, yeah. Okay. And so yeah. afterwards, the other 18 mm -hmm. followed. Yeah. Okay, so now I give this pointer to you. I will read a story uh, in Russian, because I always read in Russian uh, in order to avoid, uh, in order to avoid comic effect, I would say, from, from my accent. Uh, so this is, and then I will tell the uh, political background of the story because it is the story that you know some of you who were at my uh, talks uh, might have uh, heard it. Um, so I'm sorry for for repeating it, but it is the shortest story I read. It it takes only seven minutes to read the story. I. Uh, I would say, and I, I, I wrote it very quickly. It took me like two days uh, to do it, while normally it would take me, you know, three months to write a story or half a year. So uh, this is a story uh, that I will read in Russian, and you can uh, follow uh, the English translation. Большие возможности. Вообразите себе возможности. Скоро у него будут большие, практически неограниченные возможности. Он настаивал именно на возможностях, которые перед ним откроются, непременно, причем в самые ближайшие времена. Пусть она имеет в виду, говорил он, что у него все хорошо и теперь, прямо отлично, много лучше, во всяком случае, чем она может себе представить. Она, разумеется, никак не представляла себе ни теперешних его возможностей, ни тем более тех, на которые он намекал. Ей всего-то надо было от него, чтобы довез поскорей. Уже и не вспомнишь, куда – в редакцию, в гости, в театр. Ей что же, выходит неинтересно послушать, кто он такой? О, она, кажется, знает, но не станет произносить. Еще один приставучий, болтливый водитель – гордончик. Одно из нескольких слов по-армянски, жаргонных, которым ее научили друзья. Гордончик, несмотря на проблемы с гласными, а, да. а, куда благозвучнее, ласковее, чем бомбила по-нашему, хотя означает ровно то самое. Это Москва, каждый второй автомобиль тут такси. Только поднимешь руку и сколько, а сколько дашь. Нет, он не бомбила, этот все продолжает бубнить. И машина, на которой они сейчас едут, она не его собственная, а служебная. У самого у него имеется совершенно другая тачка. Другой, как он выразился, аппарат. Но он не собирается его на наших колдобинах убивать. А подобрал он и не потому, что нуждается в деньгах. С ударением на первый слог, очень по местечковому. Хотя уж кем-кем и евреем он быть не мог. Но и на русского не похож. Коми, Чуваш, Удмурт. Маленький, но с громадными, по его словам, возможностями впереди. Быстрый, дробный такой говорок и быстрая, но аккуратная в целом манера вождения. Лицо хоть и не безобразное, но и не выражающее ничего. Ему, продолжает он, полагается личный водитель, однако он предпочитает все делать самостоятельно. Уж не ради таких ли вот встреч. В 
Впрочем, ей-то какое дело? Остановите вон там. Так она пообедать, поужинать, вместе покушать. О, Господи! В зеркало давно смотрел на себя. Нет-нет, зачем обижать? Да и его ухаживание, так это назовем, было не наглым, а каким-то наивным, автоматическим, глупым до чрезвычайности. Ни удар, ни ум, ни таланта, большие возможности. Вот чем он пытался ее соблазнить, привлечь. Из человеческого, пожалуй, что только дефект речи, детский какой-то. Он смешно выговаривал букву «Ш». Попробовала оставить ему то ли 200 рублей, то ли 20 тысяч. Она совершенно не помнит, какие суммы были тогда в ходу. Отказался. Сунул ей карточку с личным номером. Сказал, он этот номер вообще никому не дает. Никогда. Почти. Так что, если она передумает, о, непременно. Мерси. Победы подобные этой не приносят и тени радости. И она никогда бы не вспомнила низкорослого гордончика. Мало ли кто волочился за ней до и после, хотя так нелепо, как он, мало кто, если бы не случай, не происшествие, сильнейшим образом изменившая жизнь. Утром рано пришли шестеро и собака. 18-летнюю дочь ее посадили в машину и увезли, а квартиру перевернули вверх дном, хотя у них шел ремонт и казалось сильнее переворачивать некуда. Выяснилось, что есть, еще как. Страх за дочь, ощущение того, что все происходит не с ними, не с ней, Стыд от свальных в кучу белья, старых писем, фотографий родных и чувство, что надо бороться, конечно, звать адвокатов, говорить гадости этим жлобам. Но жизнь, в общем, кончилась. Что вы ищете, господа? Какие они к черту и господа? Граждане, на каком основании производится обыск в моей квартире? На основании ордера. Вот. Экстремизм, терроризм, анархизм, записи в сети интернет. Когда надо будет, я и объяснят. Только собака вела себя более или менее пристойно. Походила, понюхала и улеглась безучастно. Она дала собаке воды. «Это что?» – спрашивает ее старший. И впервые в его голосе слышится интерес. Профессионал обнаружил в старой сумке на антресоле взорванной подкладкой карточку. Имя, фамилия, номер ту самую. «Дайте сюда!» – она выхватывает карточку из рук старшего и, не дав себе времени сообразить, что именно хочет сказать, звонит. «Слушаю» с характерным «ша». Разговор их длится едва ли минуту-две. Да и говорит-то она одна. Слезы, клятвы, мольба. Не время стесняться. Он, наконец, произносит все тем же бесстрастным тоном, которым рассказывал ей про возможности. Передайте трубку старшему. Тот выходит, потом возвращается. Значит так, закроем ее надолго, если до вторника не выйдет из страны. По номеру этому никогда не звоните. Поняли? Усмехается. Идите в отделение, забирайте свое сокровище. Цезарь, за мной. Ушли. Жизнь отымела смысл. Надпись, сделанная на заборе. Автор надписи неизвестен. Часто хорошая, самая лучшая. Автора не имеет, как частушка, пословица, анекдот. И теперь, спустя сколько-то лет, немало, потому что дочь ее за это время закончила университет в Лиле, московские подруги и друзья дочери, такие же, в общем, девочки и мальчики из хороших семей, успели отсидеть в тюрьмах и лагерях, кто весь срок, а кто часть его, им дали от 7 до 12. А сама она после многочисленных приключений и переездов оказалась в собственном доме на юге Франции. И, конечно, все эти годы она краем глаза, боковым зрением следит за карьерой своего, необходимо признать, благодетеля, водила бомбилы, гордончика, следит с ужасом. Поскольку то там, то сям, в Африке, Азии, а то и на родине, он непременно оказывается в центре какого-то немыслимого, непредставимого зла с нарушением всех божеских человеческих правил, пока наконец на глаза и не попадается сообщение о том, что его наградили звездой, орденом. Во второй уже раз, но теперь, однако, посмертно. Что пытаясь спасти экипаж и так далее, малоправдоподобная чушь без попытки поместить в нее истинные подробности. Впрочем, им и не место тут. Он погиб смертью храбрых, и с ним еще столько-то человек. И ей, как и всем комментаторам, совершенно ясно, что вся эта официальная болтовня должна только скрыть, утопить в себе то позорное, гадкое, что случилось на самом деле. Пьяную смерть на охоте, политическое убийство или что-нибудь в том же роде. Как странно, думает она, подкрашенный, припудренный, он лежит теперь со своими огромными, неограниченными возможностями в дорогущем гробу и ждет, когда под прекрасную музыку, которую вряд ли любил, его похоронят на самом, что ни на есть лучшем кладбище, рядом с писателями, артистами и композиторами. А хотела ли бы она, чтобы сообщение о самой гибели его оказалось сложным? Нет, такой вопрос себе лучше не задавать. Ей-то он сделал только хорошее, 
тогда как всем остальным только плохое, судя по тому, какую про него пишут и говорят жуть. Хорошо. Жалко ли ей этого маленького человека с детским дефектом речи? Она ведь ему обязана пусть не жизнью, но очень и очень многим, свободой дочери, этим вот югом Франции. Может и жалко, чуть-чуть. Окей. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he's able to read very fast. <laughs> well, you did um, it well. Yes, yes, yes. It was, <laughs> uh, it, it was, it was easy to follow. Yeah. And it's true. Everything, everything is in it, more or less. Uh, everything is what? Everything of, of, uh, of the Russian life is in it. Yeah, well, it's some, some of Russian life. Well, uh, this story, uh, I wrote this story because a friend of mine uh, told me Uh, that at the end of year 2021, well, it was written in September, so mm. September 21, she watched uh, television mm. accidentally because we haven't watched television. I didn't have television even in, in my Tarusa home. So it happened, you know, at barber shop or at, uh, you know, some, at the, mm. somewhere. Uh, so uh, she accidentally saw Uh, a man who uh, took her as a, you know, driver, uh, private cabbie in Moscow in the 90s, and he, who had very funny speech impediment. Uh, that's why she recognized him. Uh, she saw him on television, and it was Mr. Shaigu, who was a minister of, uh, offense, uh, of defense. Yeah. yeah, offense, yeah, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and so he uh, talked to her about, you know, his big limitless opportunities, big opportunities all the time. He repeated that. That's why she, and it was very, very stupid, really. And, and uh, Shaigu's uh, speech impediment, if you uh, ever uh, heard him speaking Russian, is that he, instead of saying R, Because in, in Russia we say, uh, you know, Russia, you know, yeah, товарищ. Uh, he says, or, like in, in uh, Baltic as, countries. Uh, yeah, uh, as, in, as in, you know, in British, uh, in, as in English. So very strange. Uh, so, uh, and then I just, you know, I found it remarkable and uh, I decided to put it down into my diary. And then I found that this is, you know, the whole the whole story. Well, actually, this, this lady who, who was, is uh, actually very, very handsome, she had uh, the search at, at her apartment at home, too. So I used that. Uh, and so the dog also came from some, you know, real life. She gave it, a wa she gave it water. It is <laughs> like, in Russia, the most strange things can happen in everyday life. When you get up in the morning, you never know how the day will end. Is that true? Well, I think... Well, Here it's all, it, we it, all, all know every morning yeah. how, we, how we will end, end in bed at the end of the evening. But, but, but in Russia, it doesn't seem to be like that. Well, I don't know. Well, since I lived mainly, almost only in Russia, I thought it's, it's life in general is like that. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? <laughs> but but, but yeah. do you think you're, you're now also in, in a sort of short story? You ended up in a short story. You had to, to, to leave your country. Suddenly, there was a huge possibility that you will never return, mm -hmm. at least as long as Putin lives. Uh, uh, you, you, you lost your beautiful house. You lost Zarusa. Uh, You've got an apartment in Moscow. You, you sold your publishing firm. Yeah, well, is it still it was, more or less? No, no, I have no no property so did, other than Tarusa. Yeah, th that's it. So, so, but your life became mm. completely different from what it used to be. Well, you're now living here in Amsterdam, opposite this theater, more or less. Exactly. Well, it's. Uh, I don't think that life has life has no plot. We very often we introduce the plot or see the plot in order to. To, to write a story or to tell a story. Uh, or we think, uh, you know, this I got because of this and that sin uh, or something. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, that's the difference. Uh, so I, uh, 
I uh, I don't think. Well, from time to time, time I think. Well, maybe it is the idea about me is mm -hmm. to to have me relocated this way, and also you know I am very grateful to 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 this country, uh, to the Netherlands because I'm you know I'm doing uh, doing many things that I wouldn't do uh, otherwise. So it's uh, uh, it's it's not only losses like. There is an expression "lost in translation." Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was a movie, yeah. right? Yeah. So there are also gains of translation, uh, and uh, of I would say gains of this transition. Mm -hmm. It's you know because uh, thanks to Otto Bude from Leiden University, you, you've yeah. got a sort of teaching job, and you're yeah. suddenly confronted with uh, students, and you've got to to talk about Russian prose, which you aren't used to. Yeah. Because you're, you, you can tell me everything about uh, electrocardiology yeah. and uh, about sitting at the desk and writing a story. But now you've got to comment on uh, uh, how a story is composed or something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, how, was the, how was that experience for you? Well, do you like it, actually? No, yes, I uh. do like it. Uh, it was very uh, you know, scary initially because, well, I used to teach uh, cardiology mm. and specifically echocardiography because I have some books on echocardiography I seem to be you know a, a knowledgeable person in this field uh, but uh, when you teach medicine uh, there is no goal that the student necessarily should love medicine it's you know he should or she should just learn it mm -hmm. right should, uh, but with Russian literature of course there is uh, if it is just uh, if it would be just the same, uh, it wouldn't make sense. So you have to make uh, students love this, uh, these stories. And I think, uh, well, at least I enjoyed it very much. Uh, although, again, you know, teaching in English to Dutch students is something, you know, Russian literature without having uh, formal uh, humanitarian uh, education, yeah. in fact. Yeah, that was something uh, unimaginable before. Yeah. Maybe uh, it's more I, clear than all these literary experts do. Well, I tried to 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 look at the and I selected the stories that somehow have some personal, yeah. uh, you know, t personal meaning for me and for them. I, I think, you know, otherwise, uh, li like this. Uh, um, you know, a, a, a lady with a with a dog uh, had some something for you, right? Uh, that's how the love starts. Yeah. But, so. but where did the love start for you? With with which Literature. writer? Yeah. Oh, I think with uh, with Pushkin when my father read uh, Pushkin to me when I was five. You know, very early actually. I and never then, really liked fairy tales, but. But I, is, I like is there one favorite amongst all those classical Russian writers? No, I don't think we, I should. Well, from time to time. Yeah. I, I remember you reading uh, uh, War and Peace every year. <laughs> Not every year. It was Alexander Bloch who recommended to read it every okay. spring. Oh, he, and, he, and he you? In you followed him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read it maybe five times, but not, you okay. know, but not it's, every It's still year. a lot. I think it's time to, to listen to music, to music again, it? yes. And yeah. then we're going to talk <laughs> about uh, your magazine yeah. and about your write, what you're writing nowadays. Yeah. Music. Mm -hmm. Now it's autumn and I'm thinking of spring and I still do love you. Пусть 
Thank you so much. Again, a, a song about uh, unhappy love, <laughs> typical for Russian society. Um, uh, we're again, we're, we're continuing to talk about literature. Mm -hmm. Are you writing now? Can you write now during these days? Because I, I, I recently read a, a letter of Michal Shushkin, a Russian writer whom I admire, who lives in Switzerland, and he has completely a complete writer's block because of the war. Well, uh, when I left uh, Russia, I went to Yerevan initially, and I called uh, my friend uh, and translator Boris Draluk uh, in America, and I said, uh, look, now I quit medicine, uh, and he said, oh, then we will have more work. We will have more to translate from you. And I said, I, I made a joke, but I didn't know how, how, in fact, how much truth is there. I said, well, no, I said, writing is for beginners. It's just for graphomaniac people. Uh, real writers, professional writers, they go, they make talks you know, and uh, lectures, it's, they are talking about writing, they are not writing. And in fact, uh, you know, I, this month, uh, I, you know, in March, uh, during the month, uh, month from now, I was in, in Ghent, in Brussels, in London, in Oxford, now here, to, and to do talking, talking, to, talking. About, about literature or, yeah, about, or yeah. about Russia? About literature, about Russia, I have several records to play. And, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, I'm not writing. And um, we will speak about the magazine soon. Uh, it's very difficult to, to find uh, decent modern prose uh, these days, but there is a lot, you know, real lot of very good uh, poems, very good poetry. And I have an you know, explanation for that because it's when, you know, the pain uh, itself uh, that we all you know suffer from it produces you know a cry and the cry could be you know very poetic uh, but for prose you need something more than a cry you need you know some difficult angles aspects and uh, and after all we do not know when and how uh, even this war would end uh, so, if you look at uh, uh, best uh, uh, novels or you know stories about the war, they all written after the war. They were not written during the war. I, I was told yes. by the Ukrainian writer Andrei mm -hmm. Kurkov that many people, soldiers on the front, started to write mm -hmm. and want to write about their experiences, as Vasily Grossman did mm -hmm. during the Second World War. Can you imagine that? Mm, well, I can imagine. They do, do it, of course, about uh, the mm -hmm. strength of defending their country. Well, yeah. Well, I can imagine that. But and plus, you know, since uh, in Russia there is no even uh, we had we had great Soviet writers, you know, like uh, Bagritsky, for example, who was a very who believed in you know communism, whatever. Uh, Platonov initially was very pro, mm -hmm. pro revolutionary writer, maybe the greatest writer of the 20th century. So we had, you know, great idea, although it was false, mm -hmm. uh, but still it was big. Uh, but look at uh, Germany; they didn't have uh, Nazi writers, any, you know, any talented uh, Nazi. Uh, no decent uh, novel was yeah, published. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and in these these days when we have no uh, even illusion on uh, you know of being being right somehow in there is there is no way it's it's you know it's it's really it's very depressive. Uh, and does that mean that 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 prose writers are more or less paralyzed? And what's happening now? Well, I can I can talk about myself uh, yeah. only. And? You know, yes, uh, and? yeah. I would say yes. Yeah. Plus, uh, being in the, uh, you know, here it's uh, it's very nice, etc. But I really have very little clue about uh, about life in 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 this country. Uh, in fact, what, what do you think? We, we read all the time that so many people are more or less 
supporting the leader. And we recently had this television series of uh, Jelle Brand Kostius and uh, Ruben Terlau. They are traveling uh, throughout uh, Central Asia. Uh, they were in, in Kazakhstan where they were interviewing uh, some of the guys who, who fled the country because they didn't want to get mobilized. Mm -hmm. And when they were asked, to whom does this country, Kazakhstan, this city in Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. belong, they didn't want to answer. And actually the answer they gave was, it belongs to Russia. Mm -hmm. And there are also many people, I hear the, the, mothers, the soldiers' mothers, they are not against this war, they are against their sons being so badly treated by their generals. Mm -hmm. So there are still very many Russians who believe in this reuniting uh, uh, with Ukraine. C can, can you well, understand that? Well, this is that? a big shame. Yes, well, yeah. It, it, it is a shame. Uh, I, I even met very pro-Putin people in the West and even uh, in America specifically. I was in the um, city of in Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa is the second biggest city in Oklahoma, in, but culturally it's the biggest city in Oklahoma in the United States. So uh, I was there for presentation of my uh, story and there was a driver who was very, you know, Trumpist and very, very right, very Republican. Uh, he was about 70 and with very deep uh, South accent, he said, like, son, you should never go to, you know, East Tulsa, or I forgot, maybe West Tulsa, uh, I, or you should take a big gun with you because, there are, you know, this kind of person. And he said uh, to me, you know, that this whole war, of course, he never been to Russia, he never been abroad, he never been to Mexico, he, he was only, he Tulsa. never been to New York, he, right. he was only in all his life in, in um, Oklahoma, in Kansas, in right. Texas, you know, in this, this area. And he said all this war was set up by Soros, he said. It is set up by Soros, for sure. And I, of course, I understood I should not argue with him, but when I came back to New York, it's, I thought to myself, maybe if Soros can set up this war, maybe he can help a magazine. So I completely forgot about him, uh -huh. so I wrote the application for and? Soros Foundation. <laughs> now I am waiting the, <laughs> the, the result. But <laughs> he used to invest yeah, lots yeah. of money into the East, yeah, Eastern yeah. Europe and Russia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And l l let's go to the magazine. Okay. And how, well, Mm -hmm. Where did the idea start? Well, the idea started with uh, Van Orschot, my publisher. They, uh, the first day I came here, they approached me this, uh, with the idea uh, that I should become publisher again. Uh, because I was doing medical publishing, we published big medical books, so I more or less I know the... Um, I know the... I, uh, I know the... Uh, uh, you know, the technology. And opa, nothing. It was there for for a second. Yeah, but yeah, there ah, it, oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Here it is. Okay. Yeah, to have all Yeah. Uh, and yeah, um, I came up with the so the idea is to publish this uh, magazine uh, both in Russian and in English, and this you can see here the uh, mm, cover. Uh, of the first issue, which is ready, and it was sent to printers yesterday, mm -hmm. or a day before mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh, so uh, the idea is to have it um, uh, four times a year, mm -hmm. quarterly, uh, in uh, Russian, and uh, possibly twice a year in English. Uh, so uh, the uh, title, Pyate Valna, comes from, you know what, I will just read the editorial. I cannot, I cannot see the, it printed here. I cannot, ah, yeah, here it is. Uh, no, 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 so, sorry, sorry, sorry. So it was, ah, yeah, here it is. So uh, I wrote this editorial and Boris Draluk translated it into English. Uh, so it will explain uh, much, I guess. Uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, every generation of Russians, those whose native language is Russian, 
has experienced its own catastrophe. The current generation has not broken that pattern. Totalitarianism has again come to Russia. Freedom of speech is severely oppressed. The number of the regime's victims and political prisoners continues to grow. And Russia is waging a war of aggression against its neighbor, Ukraine. Each catastrophe triggers an outflow of productive people from the country. The current wave of immigration is the fifth in the last hundred years or so. And just as before, both writers and readers feel an increasingly urgent need for uncensored publications. The purpose of this magazine, which we have titled The, First, uh, the Fifth Wave, is to play a part in satisfying that need. The magazine, uh, that's next page. The magazine will be published quarterly in a partnership with one or Horst in Amsterdam in two languages, Russian and English, and distributed around the world, both in paper and electronic formats. This is not the first time in history that Van Orschot has been involved in the Russian human rights movement. It is enough to mention the numerous publications of the Alexander Herzen Foundation, founded back in 1969. The Fifth Wave project is li literary, not socio-political. We plan to feature existing, well-crafted work in various genres, including poetry, fiction, art history, memoir, etc., and not only on the burning topics of the day. The contributions will be solicited from authors living in Russia and abroad, all of whom are united by their rejection of war and totalitarianism totalitarianism, their love for Russian culture as part of European culture, their sense of personal involvement in and responsibility for what is happening, and their desire to see Russia as a free, peace-loving country, no matter how far-fetched this wish may seem. Ura. So, <laughs> ura. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So um, let me show also the, the cover of uh, uh, English, uh, published by, you know, I am doing Russian uh, mainly, uh, well, uh, uh, Russian edition, and uh, Van Orschot is doing English edition. And here the uh, uh, picture of the, of the title page. Uh, and uh, the picture belongs to Semyon Agroskin, a good friend of mine and very well-known uh, artist who's, uh, he nowadays is in Paris and he has his big exhibition in Paris and in Marseille. And uh, so the, the previous one, yeah. Uh, so this is also his work, uh, actually. And so my, my cover looks more tragic, I would say, than... Yeah. than a Dutch yeah. one, right? Because actually, actually uh, a question. Mm -hmm. The fifth wave. Mm -hmm. The first wave was immediately after the revolution. Yes. When the, was the second? The second was after, during the Second World Perfect. War, when a lot of people were taken uh, by Germans, you know, and, to the and, West. And stayed and in the West. And they stayed in the West. The third? Uh, the third was mainly Jewish, but not only Jewish. It was it started in the 70s, yeah. and it ended by the beginning of 80s. Uh, and the fourth was after USSR collapsed. Yeah. It was mainly, you know, economic uh, thing, but not only economic. Many mm -hmm. many scientists uh, uh, understood that they have no chance to continue their works uh, in Russia. So it was a very big wave, too, and now it's the fifth. When I read all those names mm -hmm. of the contributors, I th actually, I don't know the majority of them, except Maxim Olsipov. No, but you I, know, I never read you know Gandlievsky, who was there My name. one month ago. There was Google, Googlev, who was here, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, well, um, I would say uh, that, you know, important uh, thing is to uh, say that it is not, you know, Russian literature in exile. 
In fact, it's, uh, you know, it's independent Russian writing. Mm -hmm. You cannot call, uh, for example, Karine Arutunova, she lives in Kiev. You cannot call her being in exile, but her mother tongue is Russian, Russian language. and uh, Russian language doesn't belong to the state and it doesn't belong to the country. Uh, it is now being spoken elsewhere. So, uh, Lena Berson lives in Israel, Vasily Antipov, this is a separate story, but you know, I, I will briefly share it with you. He lives in Germany, Gugliev lives in Moscow, Arutunova lives in uh, Kiev, Eisenberg lives in Moscow, Lichevsky lives in, lives in Israel, Vidyanyapin lives in Paris, Ganlevsky is in Georgia. Likmanov is in Uz Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. Nikolsky travels between Yerevan and Lyon. Uh, so, and me, I'm here. So, you know, it's the whole... But can you imagine the, the, the writers living in Moscow writing an anti-war story? Yes, Yuli Gugliev is a very brave man and he writes anti-war. And, uh, and of course, you know... Isn't Eisenberg that dangerous too. for them? Well, uh, it's, yeah, I think they take a big risk, but they write it, they publish it in Facebook, uh, and uh, yes, it is, it is a certain risk. They are, they are very brave people, but, uh, you know, they, they, they are poets and they write. Yeah. There's going to be an edition on paper, of course, which we can buy at the kiosk. Yes. And there's going yes. to be an edition uh, as, e, as an e-magazine. E-book, e yeah, e electronic book. book. An electronic book. Yeah, it won't be on uh, web, it won't be on, on, on the internet, hmm? the text. Uh, but electronic book, which is ready in Russian too. I was very lucky to have a great... So in people in Russia can order it by ozon.ru? No, they cannot do that because they cannot pay for it. So I have some ideas on how to uh, distribute it uh, to them from, you know, some organizations to get certain amount of copies and then allow people to just download it from the Internet. And many people wouldn't even share their emails. You know, people don't feel comfortable no, because about they that. don't want to be yeah. connected to And they an don't want to be in the mailing list or, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So, so how, how will it go, you think? How, how, will, how, will it reach, how will it reach Russia, the Russian public? Well, through the channels, I said, uh, if you send like thousand copies there, it will be everywhere because people yeah. Would but it will be a sort of Sami's dot. Yeah, sort of. Uh, yeah, sort of. Yes, yes. <coughs> Actually, we should turn to the floor to to. Yes, ask I people. think we should ask people to if they have questions. If they have get, got questions, because questions from the floor can always be very interesting. So there is somebody in the. Yes, that's Please. very good. The first one. Uh, what is happening with uh, Ukrainian and Russian? Uh, there is a problem, no? <laughs> there is a problem, yes. <laughs> there is a very big problem, yes. But, but, but what will you do <laughs> between the language or between the countries? Yeah, no, I mean... Uh, uh, the language, I'm talking only about the language. You say there is uh, someone uh, from Kiev writing in your uh, thing? Yes, she is so a Russian writer from Kiev. Uh, uh, yeah. So she okay. is writing in Russian. But I know many, uh, many Ukrainians who try to avoid Russian yeah. language at yeah. all. And, uh, you know, my personal rule is never start speaking to Ukrainians first, because I had some, especially in, in Germany when I spent some months, uh, you know, uh, the, there were some experiences that people just didn't want to talk at all. Uh, although some people like Silvestrov, for example, a very famous modern uh, contemporary composer, maybe one of the, the best composers, uh, living composers, he was very open uh, to talk and we became good friends, although he had to run away from, from Ukraine. Uh, 
and very often, you know, what happened in the trains, in the, in, in the trains you can easily recognize refugees. Uh, you see uh, a woman with uh, a kid uh, or, or two children and uh, you try to help them, you know, to connect to internet, to show how to open uh, toilet, door, or, you know, to, to find to, to the, the children's compartment uh, in the train. And then they would ask, uh, are you Ukrainian? Then they would make a pause and say, or you are for a long time here. So I always said, well, I'm for a long time here, yes, <laughs> very long. So, yes. Of do you have confidence in the durability and the stability of this magazine project for the next couple of years? No. Because I'm thinking of a, a predecessor exile magazine in the 30s, uh -huh. Klaus Mann uh, published his uh, famous uh, magazine, um, Die Sammlung. Die Sammlung with, um, uh, a publisher in Holland, uh, and uh, it lasted only two years, and then uh, it, uh, writers uh, left. Um, there was opposition, even from his father, Thomas, and um, and subscribers were uh, limited, and so you have, you have confidence for a stable situation for at least a couple of years. Uh, you are talking about. You know, financial situation of this magazine. The stream of contributions of writers and... Well, I'm more or less confident, yes, that there will be contribution. Uh, we have very interesting materials in the first volume. Uh, some of the materials, well, we have to work on it. Uh, the, I would say that the biggest, uh, the biggest um, story in this uh, magazine is written not by a writer, but by a musician uh, who spent eight months in Belarusian prison. And he's a very uh, special, I would say, uh, person uh, to whom I helped a lot to write because he, he was not a writer at all. Uh, and I think, but he's a very gifted person, very uh, in many, many aspects, uh, physically very strong, uh, very, uh, he was an, not only a musician, a professional musician, uh, but also an alpinist and he, you know, they, you would, it is already translated into English. If, if you are interested, you will have a chance to read uh, this story. So, uh, you know, I try to um, collect material not only from professional writers, but, but from many people. And I hope that uh, after, uh, we have uh, already very good second volume. So I, I hope that uh, we will be able to, to have enough content, yes. Um, uh, and with the help of uh, Prince Bernard uh, Cultural Fund, who helped us, and uh, another fund which asked not to be named, and a couple uh, individuals, uh, uh, Germans, who are helping, and you know some others. Uh, I hope I will, you know, I really feel like, yeah, I'm I'm quite optimistic about the the future of this magazine. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, uh, oh. Well, if someone is if 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 someone is interested. Of course, I don't know German. Well, I have a very, very limited knowledge of German, and I am not very well connected there. So, of course. I mean. mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, first of all, uh, Mr. Osipov, um, congratulations with your uh, magazine. Uh, I'm looking forward to buying uh, the first issue. Um, my question is about um, what you mentioned about your experience here in the Netherlands. Uh, you said uh, you appreciate the uh, being here, but at the same time you said that uh, you found it also um, alien, or at least hard to uh, understand what's going on here. I was wondering, is that because uh, you find it um, an alien country, or is it just the language? 
No, well, it is a language and it is, you know, in Tarusa, it took me about, I would say, a year and a half before I understood what is really going on. Although uh, they all spoke Russian and I lived my whole life there. So here, you know, I just, I, I frequently give this example. I, I was in um, Barcelona uh, a few months ago and uh, I walked with my uh, publisher, Spanish publisher, over the streets of Barcelona and I said, look, I don't understand who, who are these semi-naked, uh, you know, young women on the other side of the street. Are they prostitutes? And he said, no, they are foreigners. And I said, how do you know they are foreigners? I mean, it's obvious. I mean, they are foreigners going from one party to another without, you know, putting, bothering to put a jacket or something, a coat. So, but for him, I'm sure he was right. So, because there are some small things that uh, we do not, when we switch, for example, when we switch uh, television programs, we immediately can say, well, this is commercial, this is detective story, this is political something, from, from which, you know, during a second, one second, just, you know, because people dress this way, you know. Uh, so when, when Greek, um, in Greek tragedy, there were certain uh, animals, you know, certain colors, and in Greek comedy, there were other animals, other colors, uh, it seems to us, you know, strange to have this, uh, but we, in fact, have the same. Otherwise, how we would, would we tell? But here, I, if I come to, let's say, cafe or something, I cannot say, like, okay, this is an uh, educated person, uh, you know, possibly university degree, whatever. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, possibly, whatever, uh, a peasant, a carpenter, I don't know. Uh, but you know, so it's uh, in Tarusa I was able to, to, yeah. to, to, to just see small things. Like I, I showed you at the picture that uh, Michel uh, had at his first book. You know, you, you can immediately get yeah. You know, yeah. details there. Mm -hmm. Laura Starik. Oh, there he is. Sorry. <laughs> Bad luck. Uh, yeah, well, I wasn't, I yeah, but it comes from you, my Oh, my. Oh, yeah, that much so. Um, Mr. Osipov, thank you very much for uh, launching this magazine. It's, a, it's really a big thing, I think, and very important. I have a question about the Ukrainian side. Um, is, uh, I mean, if we, would, uh, if we would make a list of all the crimes of Putin, it would, we, we could go on endlessly. But I think one of the biggest crimes is that he managed in a couple of years to make uh, enemies, uh, to make these big, big, big uh, uh, problems between Russians and hatred between Russians and, and Ukrainians. Uh, do you think that it would have you? Do you have any plans to uh, to reach out to Ukrainian poets to join uh, in your magazine, or do you think that at this moment that is impossible? I mean, there are lots of Ukrainian poets: Zhadan, Zabushko, uh, Andrukhovic, uh, uh, Grzesonski, uh, mm -hmm. that that would maybe be interested in joining uh, your effort, or it, mm -hmm. or do you think that it, at this at this time it's impossible? And the second well, question is, if I may, uh, is, is about cancel culture. Uh, Michel already mentioned it. Uh, it's, of course, a very painful subject. Uh, uh, I have lots of Ukrainian friends who, who were Russian spoker, speakers and uh, now force themselves to, to speak only Ukrainian. Um, uh, can you understand uh, their abhorrence of the Russian culture? Uh, and how do you relate to that? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, about Ukrainian uh, uh, materials in, in this magazine. No, well, look, it's two different languages. So this is Russian magazine. I do not know Ukrainian. It would be at least strange if I start, uh, you know, publishing on the language which I do not know. Uh, second, uh, many Ukrainians do not want to participate in events uh, with Russian writers, even if, you know, they know that these writers are against the war and, you know, signed uh, letters, etc., etc. So I don't foresee, 
Ukrainian authors in this magazine in the nearest future or maybe ever. Uh, about cancelled culture, well, I don't really feel it myself. Uh, I think that uh, it is natural for in Ukraine uh, to, uh, to avoid Russian language and avoid Russian culture uh, these days. Uh, I don't care about destroyed uh, Pushkin's monument uh, because it's, uh, you know, when, when children are being killed, uh, then there is no, no uh, room for sentiment about uh, monuments. Uh, and plus, artistically, uh, I guarantee these monuments are not the, the greatest ones, so they, they should be destroyed <laughs> very often. Uh, and uh, as for cancelled culture here, I don't feel it. You know, I, uh, I am honored to uh, run, this is the second event uh, here in the center of Amsterdam on Russian culture. Uh, and there will be two more, so how can I complain about that? Uh, there are some people who uh, say, I, I saw this, uh, you know, banners saying uh, there is, uh, let's cancel Dostoevsky because in every word of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky there is, you now we can hear a butcher and their ping uh, and whatever. I don't think it's too smart. Uh, personally, I think that you know, you cannot say you, you can hear uh, Schmeisser's and Mr. Schmidt's and, you know, sense of uh, gas chambers from every note of Beethoven or Bach. You know. That would be ridiculous, I guess. And uh, plus, you know, Russian culture is imperialistic culture, yes, but it is also anti-imperialistic culture. Uh, there are many things, uh, you know, many Russians uh, in the 20th century were killed by, uh, by uh, the government, uh, etc. It's, it's much more complex than people want to see, really. And uh, so I think it's, it's a bit, you know, uh, it, and, you know, if somewhere in Warsaw uh, they would not dance uh, Nutcracker, uh, then, you know, Tchaikovsky will remain Tchaikovsky, Pushkin will remain Pushkin, and we will remain who we are. So, yeah. And here, in the middle. Yeah, we come with me. Yeah. First, uh, thank you for uh, sharing your uh, personal uh, journey. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question, um, a totally different question. Uh, if you have to choose, uh, would you choose uh, being a writer or uh, for cardiology? Well, I have chosen to be both, as you could, could see. <laughs> no, it's, it's totally different. Uh, it occupies totally different parts of brain, really. Uh, it's not much similarity in this uh, profession. I, I don't think it's, it's a real choice. You know, it's, uh, uh, I have chosen to be a writer only now because it would not be possible to uh, start from scratch, uh, to, to, to learn a new language and to go all the stages young uh, doctor must, must go. So it's, I don't have time for that. Uh, but uh, of course, I miss it too. But mevrouw yeah. beneden. Hallo, ik ben Karina Holla en ik ben theater um, theatermaker en ik uh, met Svetlana Alexeevich in Amsterdam en ik heard about haar werk in Zweden, waar ze had also lived en ze uh, wrote het boek Warrior Women about how women, Russian women. Uh, fought in the war and made a play about it, Warrior Women, and uh, when the war broke out, I had to play the play. <laughs> and we thought about to uh, el eliminate all Russian names, which I didn't do. And um, uh, with fear in my heart, I played this play, uh, w w Warrior Women. And um, then it seemed that the public had different problems, some problems from Spain, some problems of being Jewish. So they were not at all at that moment into this war. 
And now we're going to play it in Groningen and later perhaps in the north of Sweden again. And I'm very connected to Svetlana and I'm very connected to the people there. And one of the sentences was um, a lot of people think that Hitler um, <laughs> uh, fought. No? Uh, the Americans, sorry. The Americans have uh, defeated Hitler. But there are not so many people who know how many um, debt the Russians have given, like 40 million in three years. And the end of the sentence is, the only way is to love each other and to understand each other with love. So I want to say that. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Move in. Um, well, I also lived in Russia for quite a while, uh, and when the war started, I started contacting everybody I knew there, basically. I was very curious what their opinion was about the war, and I was very surprised and aghast and disappointed with that quite a few people that had never expected uh, it off turned out to be supporting of the war, and the people who were very strong, strongly against the war, that some of them during recent months also turned uh, the corner and started to support uh, the war. And ba basically, it's impossible for me now to continue communicating with me. It's pointless also. You get into a fight immediately, and the, the ar arguments just lock you. There are no lines of communications <laughs> that I feel are still useful. Um, I read an article by uh, a Dutch journalist calling upon Russians and saying that worldwide they're much too passive and calling upon them to write a convincing, beautifully, beautifully written open letter against the war and trying to find as many Russians that people know, famous Russians, to uh, sign, sign on to that. Um, so I think that that would be a good uh, initiative, and I think you would be perfectly equipped to start that and write something beautifully and convincing. So I, I'm wondering <laughs> what your uh, opinion is uh, about this idea. Well, my opinion is that I am not going to convince uh, anyone because I think it's it's useless uh, if someone is taking part of you know murderers and criminals, uh, there is no way uh, I can change their mind. I couldn't change it. I have a far relative uh, who seemed to, you know, respect me for many, many years. And he also took the part of, you know, of Putin, let's say, uh, years ago during uh, this Crimea invasion. And we had you know, several conversations with him, and we, I, I told him, you know, I would never call him again. Uh, and if I ever miss him, I will just turn on television for five minutes, and that would be it. Because he is, he, he is watching television. Propaganda is very strong, very professionally uh, designed. And, uh, you know, so the aim uh, of this magazine, and this magazine, after all, it is not political magazine, it's... Uh, it is literary magazine. Uh, of course, uh, it has, you know, as I, as I said, it has, you know, we are all agree uh, about certain things, uh, including the war. To write a letter to whom? Well, we we had we had we had hundreds, thousands of letters. Yeah. Well, yet yet another letter would not hurt. Yeah. That if you're asking about this this particular letter, yes, of course. Yeah. Please. You want me to write a letter? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I told you what I think. I I won't do that because I think it's useless. I, I, I wrote many letters already. It didn't, they didn't stop the war. Okay, okay, okay. I do it. <laughs> I write a letter. That's typical Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, there in, in the corner. I, I, 
I can speak very loudly. Thank you very much. Where is your magazine, The Fifth Wave, available in Amsterdam? Uh, pardon me? Where will, your, where will your magazine, The Fifth Wave, be available in Amsterdam? Oh, we should. In you mean in, in, in electronic form? Uh, you would be able to buy it from website that is now being built, uh, and uh, it will be ready you know, by next week, I, th I hope. Uh, in uh, printed form in the, in the bookstores, uh, in Russian. And in English, you can buy it from website, again, you know, of Van Orschot. Uh, and uh, again, in, in English, uh, in, in bookstores, I guess. Uh, yeah. So, in traditional, traditional ways of distribution, I would say. Yeah. Um, I thought uh, the magazine was and in Russian and in English, but that's not. Uh, no, no, it will be two different editions. It will be Russian edition, English edition, because it's not be. It will not be bilingual edition. It will be. Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah, we have a question. Above. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you kindly, uh, Mr. Uh, Asipov, for bringing back the discussion about Russian literature on stage. Um, my question is related to precisely that, when we are still amidst of a very diffuse, complex, um, filthy, messy situation of warfare uh, involved many parties, involved many stories um, uh, with very still unclear narratives that have to be defined and time history will tell us probably uh, more. What is or can be the role of literature in it while amidst this state of affairs? So the question was about the role of literature. Well, I, I would not exaggerate. I should say that the word that we are looking for is humility for writers, because it's, uh, you know, braveness of Ukrainian soldiers, the amount of uh, Western economic and military aid uh, is important, uh, the strength of Zelensky, uh, these factors are the key factors, not literature in this war. Yeah. I would not, I would not <laughs> rely upon literature. It didn't help to, to, to prevent the war. It would not help to end it. The last question. Yeah, let's have something more positive. Than you have fear. To the end. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure it's a positive question, but I try. <laughs> Thinking about literature, Russia. that it will not help stop the war. But we, can also, we also have to think about after the war. Can you imagine uh, what the contribution will be of literature, of culture, to re, to sort of re, re establish, to re educate Russia after, after the war stopped? Can you say something about it? Well, I, I am not very, I am not look looking at the literature or any kind of uh, arts uh, that pragmatically. I think, uh, you know, literature and art in general serve uh, purposes of, of beauty. Uh, so, of course, it has humanistic, you know, component into it, and I, I'm sure that, you know, this humanistic uh, thing will, you know, will, will, will be there, will be present there, and those who have ears will, will hear. Uh, so that's that what, I, what I think about it. Okay, so let's switch to music then. Ah, yeah, sorry. This calls for the famous Dostoevsky quote that only beauty will save the world. Yeah, yes, well, in a way, yeah. Okay, we can discuss the, uh, the, the whole of it during uh, the vodka, which is be going to be served in the hall. I'd like to thank <laughs> you very much, Maxim. Well, thank Osipov. you very much, but we have music. Um, no, we are, we, we, after I close down, 
uh, had okay. listened to the last song. I thank you for coming here, for listening to Maxim Osipov. I hope you, Maxim, will soon start writing again okay. thank about you these so much. strange people <laughs> of the Dutch. Yeah, thank you. And Salah. Finally, Arnie yeah, Thank you. Thank okay. you, Michelle. And let's introduce let's the last. Uh, the last song, Maxim asked me to sing a Ukrainian lullaby. The dream asks sleep. Where should we rest tonight? Where the cottage is warm, where the cat is purring. There, my little child will sleep.